Welcome back 2021ers. This will be our final lecture discussing the memory system. Although certainly computer memory is not going to leave us and we'll have other chances to touch on the effects that the operating system and the virtual memory system have on RAM. For the moment though, we'll devote our, tem uh, our attention to the final topic in this sequence, which is to discuss permanent storage. This is also covered in a large part in chapter six of Brown and Halloran, and you'll want to have look at least briefly at some of the discussion of permanent storage there, such as disk drives and their alternatives. Homework 10 is up and is uh, tasking you to optimize a column summing routine so that it has a similar performance to what the cost of summing across rows looks like. This is going to be very related to our project and look for that in the next day or so to go up where you'll be tasked with optimizing uh, an access pattern to a matrix computation of some time. A reminder also that exam two and project three grades are up and so you should have a look at those and Phrase your regrade requests uh, by Sunday and Monday, uh, respectively, for them. We left off last time in a discussion of a simple cache placement algorithm, uh, wherein we discussed in the upper right a tiny cache and the big main memory store on the lower left. Big in this case is fairly relative. Uh, we only gave ourselves 8-bit addresses. Uh, that's the pair of hexadecimal codes over here that comprise the memory address. And saw that this is pieced apart in little chunks that are used to determine where this particular chunk of main memory would go in cache. Uh, in this case, uh, slot or set one zero. Uh, that's uh, this one over here. Uh, and examining whether or not this tag that's present in the cache matches uh, the main memory sort of address uh, and the tag bits which are upper over here tells you if what you're looking for can be found in cache without ever having to go out to main memory. Generally, caches then have a much faster turnaround time in the nanosecond range versus main memory accesses take uh, up to 100 or more nanoseconds in modern systems. If you can find things in cache, you can keep the CPU fed in load instructions much faster than you would be able to otherwise. Even this sort of uh, approach, though, has some drawbacks, and we discussed some alternatives in modern caches uh, to avoid things like thrashing and conflict misses uh, by developing associative caches. It's much more complex hardware, uh, but much better in terms of uh, avoiding uh, inadvertent conflicts uh, in the cache uh, and keeping the CPU fed. We ended with a brief discussion of how you can find out, at least on Linux systems, some details of the cache uh, that is present on the CPU. Uh, your standard LS CPU utility will give you some high-level information about the caches, and by traversing this little sysdevices subdirectory and digging down to the CPU information that's buried within it, you can actually see the different caches that are present and inspect various qualities of them, uh, such as their number of ways of sensitivity, size, and so forth. We're going to leave uh, the memory system uh, as a sort of ephemeral entity and turn our attention now to persistent storage. Usually this comes under a couple different monikers, uh, persistent or block storage. And this is your general sort of discussion of disks and disk drives. Although the disk aspect of this as a circular thin kind of entity uh, is actually a little bit uh, dated at this point because you should all know that there are additional kinds of drives that don't actually involve a disks like that. Uh, generally then, when you would power a system off, as in press the power button or pull the plug, uh, then the main memory that you have uh, that's in DRAM and the static SRAM caches uh, along with the registers in the CPU, they will very quickly use the ones and zeros that are stored in them. At the base of the memory pyramid then is this very large permanent storage area associated with disks. Uh, these are big, but they're generally very slow. Uh, and importantly then, they also have this persistent quality uh, that due to the physics that are used and the materials uh, that are present in these, uh, when you power them off, they actually retain the ones and zeros that are stored in there about the information. And of course, this makes computing a lot nicer because you don't have to restart your computation or start rewriting your paper every time you power off and power on your system. The permanent storage then uh, serves that important purpose. The other uh, thing that we'll see that it can be used for is to create the illusion that you actually have more main memory uh, than you actually do on a system. 
an operating system can usually be configured to treat some portion of disk. Uh, for instance, a couple gigabytes uh, of DRAM it can be complemented with six gigabytes of disk space to make all programs think they actually have eight gigabytes of main memory to use. Uh, this is done usually in something called a swap file uh, and can be, be used to extend the amount of memory individual programs uh, seek and make it seem as though each uh, program has the entirety of main memory all to itself, even though in reality they're sharing. Uh, this swapping business usually has to do then with the two gigabytes of RAM here uh, being occasionally utilized for a program, and as it grows in size and uses more RAM, some of that will be swapped to disk space uh, while you use other portions of it. Uh, this is much slower than using RAM, and so the OS tries to utilize this in an efficient way. We'll see in the virtual memory system that DRAM can serve as a sort of cache uh, for main memory as well. Uh, but that discussion of the virtual memory system is down the line a little ways, uh, so be patient on that front. For the moment, though, we'll discuss uh, some of the flavors of this permanent storage and talk briefly a little bit about what's involved in getting uh, permanent storage on that front and the kinds of permanent storage devices you can expect to see in the not-too-distant future. These generally divide into three broad categories that we'll touch on. The standard rotating disk drive, uh, the more new and sexy solid-state drive, and your traditional magnetic tape drive. Uh, all of these have a place in the modern realm, uh, although if you haven't had exposure to some of them, uh, this will be your first taste of that. We'll start with what's in the middle of this, uh, which is the magnetic uh, sort of rotating disks that I grew up with. Uh, these are interesting, and if we had been in person, I actually acquired a few of these drives uh, that were pieced apart, and you can actually well, look at that. They're fairly interesting, but uh, if you remove the covers, they look sort of like this. I have these incredibly shiny, cool, mirror-like surfaces on them. Uh, these disks, and they really are like little disks or referred to as platters here, uh, contain uh, some sort of a material that can be magnetized easily. And so you think of there being a little line on here like this uh, around the ring of the disk uh, that contains a sequence of ones and zeros that are represented by tiny magnets that are um, magnetized with a north or south pole. Uh, if you don't know much about uh, the physics of magnets, uh, you should at least have seen some bar magnets uh, back in the past uh, where there are always two sides to a magnetic field uh, and uh, those two sides then serve as the ones and zeros that can store on here, uh, magnetized north or magnetized south, as it were. Uh, so a tiny area then is magnetized that way, and this tiny little uh, head will float across and then magnetize as the disk rotates uh, a little area that's next to it. So that can be alternatively a one or a zero, and as the disk rotates you can uh, put another uh, one or zero on there by magnetizing again. So this little disk head has some uh, electronics in it that allow for that magnetization to happen. In truth, this disk isn't singular, that there's a whole platter of them, as it were. So if you were to take this assembly out, you'd see four or six of these disks stacked on top of one another. And depending on the type of drive, there may be heads that are on top and on bottom of each, so that each side of the disk could independently store information. Uh, this is done to some extent to create a more compact form and allow for more storage. Uh, and to some extent, it also allows the disks to be somewhat fault tolerant. And this in all the storage that's present here isn't necessarily made available to the user. Instead, some of these platters will be used to store redundant copies of information in the event that you have crashes. And in this case, a crash is quite literal, uh, that this tiny head here, and the many heads along here, float on top of this disk on a thin bubble of air. Uh, and this allows then the head to not damage the surface of the uh, spinning uh, disk and make use of a magnetic field to alternatively plop down ones and zeros or read the ones and zeros that are present there. Magnetization like that is permanent. However, uh, if the head wobbles too much and crashes into the surface, it will damage that surface and destroy and render unusable, not this uh, space there. So usually these things are packaged in a sort of vacuum seal to prevent dust and other debris from getting inside. Once you open it up, it's basically uh, hosed at that point and not usable uh, subsequently. 
Uh, so uh, the analogy that I've heard is this is uh, something like having a Boeing 757 uh, jetliner flying 300 miles an hour, like six feet off the ground. So it's a sort of miracle of physics uh, that folks are able to pull this off. And it's no wonder then uh, that you experience disc crashes at, uh, at various points. Uh, in most modern uh, hard drives that have this spinning capacity, there's also electronics built in along with a little gyroscope to detect if the disk is dropped, such as you have a spinning drive in a laptop and you drop the laptop, then the heads are instantly frozen uh, to prevent them from crashing into uh, the platters here and otherwise causing damage. So there are a couple things that are interesting then about the physical properties of this. Uh, you can magnetize things on and off uh, fairly fast. However, you're relying upon this medium to spin, uh, as in move physically. So this little spindle uh, arm here will cause a rotation in this thing. Uh, and that leads to some of the interesting features of disk drives. Uh, so if you're looking to buy one of these, uh, then you might investigate the following things. Uh, certainly bigger capacity is great, However, um, the rotational delay and seek time associated with the disk uh, is a very important factor to be aware of. Uh, the faster that you can spin this thing, uh, the quicker you can get to a particular sector. So if the head is right here and the disk is oriented such, what you want is farther out and on the opposite side of the disk. Generally, you have to allow the head to move across and rotate the disk around uh, to get to that point. This creates a delay because while the disc is spinning around and adjusting the head to the right position to start reading, uh, you just can't get any information that is of use to you. Uh, to that end, these properties dictate how long you're waiting uh, just to get information. Once you align uh, the disc uh, or the head to the proper spot in the disc, uh, there's a limit to how fast it can read and therefore uh, spin that disc. And this can uh, then limit the transfer rate uh, as you would read things off the hit that uh, the head, it would be communicated across a wire and through an interface to talk to the rest of the computing system. Uh, we will have a look at the full system uh, very shortly here. So you can see that some of these operations can actually happen in parallel, and you're not looking at just one but several disks here. Generally, though, uh, you'll be communicating off of one of the things that's being read here. Uh, this reads, leads to one of the most interesting facets associated with spinning disk drives, and that they are quite good at sequential reads. As you have a big file, and it is distributed across this disk uh, as one long contiguous hunk. Uh, then this is generally fairly fast. Once you get the disk ahead positioned right, you can read bits uh, consecutively and this goes fast. However, if you're jumping all over the place in the disk, uh, then you'll spend quite a bit of time rotating the disk around and moving the head just to position it in the right spot uh, to either acquire or change some data that's in there. Most operating systems are aware of these facets of the disk and so use special algorithms to try to schedule and make writing and reading things from the disk as efficient as possible. Generally though then this is done in batch and so as you would make a request in your program for instance to read a file, the operating system might put your program on hold uh, as it rotates the disk around uh, and finds the right spot and give another program another chance to, to do work while that delay is happening. We'll see some more semantics associated with that sort of delay and then restart of your program momentarily. At any rate, uh, folks often ask me uh, as they're looking to buy a new laptop or desktop, what's the, you know, what should I look for in a laptop or desktop? My only real piece of advice is if you have the money for it, avoid buying a rotating disk. Instead, buy the more expensive but generally much more pleasant solid state drive. These are comprised of flash memory. And so if you have placed, uh, played at all with the little thumb drives that you can plug into USB ports, they're essentially a larger version of this along with some circuitry uh, to allow access of the flash memory that's stored on here at various parts. Now this doesn't actually answer to you what exactly is flash memory on that front, uh, but the, we're not gonna go into the sort of the details of what that looks like. Generally, uh, the best analogy I've heard for it is essentially you have some areas uh, here with some physical media that you can essentially cram electrons into uh, to create an electric field. And the cramming causes those electrons to be stored at a more or less permanent uh, uh, rate 
and you can then detect uh, using other search tree uh, the stored absence of uh, charge or a pre uh, lack of charge that will be corresponding a, a zero or a one uh, in there. Um, this cramming process has some missing properties. Uh, for instance, it has no moving parts. Well, I mean, parts are moving, it's just they're electrons, so they're tiny and very fast compared to a physically spinning uh, platter like this thing over here. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the storage of electrons in this way causes degradation over time. And so as you repeatedly write things uh, to an area uh, and then change what's in there, as in I need to pull some electrons out, so now I need to cram some more in, that medium begins to degrade over time. Generally, it's stable as it holds electrons, but every time you change it, uh, there is some damage done to it. So that over time, these solid state drives, uh, they break down uh, due to the many writes that are done to them. Again, operating systems are aware of this and have algorithms that they use when they detect a solid state drive uh, to optimize their lifetime. And generally, the internal framework and circuitry of the solid state drive is designed to also optimize write performance uh, so that you extend the lifetime of the drive. Generally, you shouldn't have to worry about this in your programs, uh, in your sort of mundane programs, uh, unless you're doing something very special. Reads are generally faster than writes because uh, you can detect the field and not change it as quickly. Uh, but uh, generally then that detection, since you're not moving anything around, uh, can be done fast both in a sequential fashion, but also much faster in a random fashion than having to spin the disk and move the head all around as the case in the older uh, spinning hard drives. The price, of course, you pay for all of these conveniences uh, is in dollars, and that a terabyte internal 2.5 hard drive costs between 40 and 50 degrees, uh, uh, 50 bucks. Uh, that's uh, the sort of traditional uh, hard drive with the spinning disks and so forth. Uh, versus the standard solid state drive, and this is a couple years back, uh, that's uh, equivalent uh, for a terabyte could cost up to $250. Uh, that's uh, an order of magnitude more expensive, and you're looking at several, uh, an order of magnitude difference in the cents per gigabyte storage uh, in that respect. This is getting better all the time, but the spinning drives are better understood at this point uh, and cheaper to manufacture versus the newer solid state drives uh, have many advantages except for cost. That said, unless you're uh, planning to download oodles and oodles of videos, either legal or illegal, uh, I would suggest strongly favoring these solid state drives uh, because their speed is just blinding. Uh, I made the mistake when I purchased my most recent desktop of uh, trusting that the spinning drives would be better. Uh, the System boot up time for my uh, desktop now is just painfully slow, as in it takes uh, upwards of a couple minutes uh, just to get that thing up and running, versus I press the button uh, on my laptop and am back up and running even from a complete reboot in a matter of seconds. Uh, so the solid state drive is largely responsible for that, though smaller is much preferred. Uh, so at any rate, uh, keep that in mind. Uh, now, some of you may have heard of something called a tape drive before. This is an older storage form and actually has a long history. Uh, there is literally in these uh, cassettes, as they were, uh, two reels, and on it is a thin tape, uh, just like scotch or masking tape, except this is also a kind of magnet uh, magnetic surface. Uh, similar in ways then uh, to the spinning hard drive, as the tape moves from one side to the next, uh, it exposes a small portion of the tape up here at the edge, uh, which allows machinery uh, like this tape drive uh, to place ones and zeros on there by magnetizing the tape or read the ones and zeros that are present there. And in the past, some older computing systems uh, back in the 80s actually distributed programs on standard cassette tapes like this. Uh, so your drive would really be uh, very much like a tape player, and you could alternatively then pop in a cassette tape that had music on it and play it. Uh, this was a bit before my time, uh, but that principle made its way into so-called floppy drives. Uh, the, what you're seeing here is actually three and a half inch floppy drive that would store up to a megabyte or two. Uh, it's actually fairly stiff because it's made out of rigid plastic, but inside is a floppy sort of uh, tape uh, 
uh, substance that looks like one of these except made into a pizza instead. And it's more or less a precursor of the hard magnetic platters uh, that came after it. Uh, earlier floppy drives were much bigger uh, and actually made out of a uh, sort of plastic that you could bend fairly easily. At any rate, uh, those kinds of media are very, very cheap to, to manufacture and were understood fairly early on. They pervaded early computing and pervaded uh, the music industry as well before uh, the illustrious uh, compact disc CD came along and killed it. Uh, they still have a place in computing right now because their price per gigabyte of storage is just a pittance compared to all other uh, alternatives. And so in the modern era, they are typically used for backup systems. As in every night, the CSE Labs machines uh, will look at everybody's home directories and have a look at what files have changed and then create a backup uh, of those files, which is written to a CSE uh, Labs tape drive, uh, which is then probably transported for safety measures uh, at intervals uh, to an offsite storage. Uh, if you watch the right uh, Star Wars movies, you might see examples of this in which uh, lots of tapes are collected in some Imperial archive and pulled out by a mechanical arm uh, for uh, access uh, as you need it. Uh, so certainly you can start to appreciate this is an extremely slow process because uh, even in a single tape drive, I'm spinning things around linearly. I don't even have the advantage of uh, spinning hard drive where I have some parallelism here. There's literally one track here and I have to, if I'm what I'm looking for is way ahead in the tape, spin it forwards at some rate until I get there. Uh, if you combine that then with uh, the archiving system where you have a whole bunch of tapes and have to select one with a big moving arm like this, uh, you're waiting minutes in order to get access to stuff versus uh, several million nanoseconds, uh, which is the case uh, in the spinning hard drive, uh, versus uh, several tens of thousands of nanoseconds, uh, which is associated with the solid state drives. So at any rate, uh, you can see that this pyramid then extends out to permanent storage just as it did before. That you have something that's relatively expensive, but relatively fast in the form of these solid state drives, somewhat uh, slower, uh, but still much more abundant in terms of gigabytes per dollar in the form of these rotating drives. And beneath that, something that is yet, yet cheaper per gigabyte, uh, but woefully slow by comparison. All of them have a place uh, in modern computing, and so it's worthwhile to be aware of their existence out there. I don't suggest to anyone that they go home and buy a tape backup system unless you have a very special set of needs. This calls to mind then, uh, to some extent, how the whole I.O. and memory system work uh, in concert together. Uh, we've discussed this upper half just a little bit that the CPU as a chip has some amount of storage on it. And we saw that over here as the omitted cache memory up here. But when something is needed that isn't found in cache, uh, cache miss uh, due to coldness or conflict or something like that, uh, then the CPU has some sort of an interface mechanism that will go off chip uh, to across a bus and across some sort of a controller chip uh, to talk to the main memory chips, which are separate from the CPU entirely. And this is where you get several gigabytes of fast DRAM storage in the form of those memory chips. These buses, as they're called, are actually just uh, collections of wires, either a single wire that has some sort of a serial communication uh, uh, protocol on it, or a parallel bus where you have a bunch of parallel wires running across so you can communicate at once several bits at a time, 16, 32, etc. cetera. Uh, and that can allow faster transfer of uh, memory, for instance, across the bus uh, into the CPU. Connected to this whole business then though is the other part of the memory system uh, and the general input output bus. Attached to this are things like the disk controller, uh, which is a little microcontroller that's kind of like a CPU in its own right, whose sole responsibility is to work with the disk, uh, to satisfy uh, requests from this uh, CPU and the main memory uh, chips, uh, to acquire data from specific locations on disk, transmit it across this shared set of wires uh, with a target of going into main memory or into the CPU or something like that. Uh, in addition to this, the general I.O. bus here usually also accounts for user interactions through devices like mice and keyboards uh, or display of information to users on output uh, to the monitor and so forth. In the modern era, uh, you'll see that this graphics connection here 
is potentially a little different than what it appears right now. Uh, with the advent and incorporation of graphics cards into CPU systems, usually then there's a special bus that attaches the monitor uh, directly to some other computing chip like a graphics card on here. And that uh, coprocessor, as it were, would probably be have a, a special communication uh, interface to the CPU as well. Uh, all of this is laid down on a physical device called a motherboard, which dictates what kind of CPU can slide into it, uh, where and how much memory is supported, uh, the speed and connections of these various buses, uh, and generally then what you can attach uh, to connect together to form the computing system as a whole. There are a couple things that are to be mentioned here. The reason that these two buses are treated separately is that generally the CPU runs at the fastest speed of everything on this system. Uh, and it will run uh, sort of faster than anything else in terms of its clock speed. Uh, that said, memory is still a relatively fast thing to be able to access compared to human interfaces where we are pitifully slow compared to the CPU and memory. Uh, and the disk controller, which if it has physically moving parts or even uh, the solid straight sort of access mechanisms, is still slow compared uh, to the ability to access things in DRAM. We're talking hundreds of nanoseconds versus tens of thousands or millions of nanoseconds uh, to access things on a disk. To that end, it makes sense to have the wires that connect the CPU and the main memory system uh, operate at a faster rate to allow these two speedy entities to communicate with each other uh, and do business at a greater uh, rapidity than you can with the rest of this stuff. It doesn't make sense uh, to be checking on things like mouse clicks or key presses from the keyboard at the same rate because the folks that are using this, uh, you and I, just don't type fast enough to make it worth the while of CPU. Uh, so this I.O. bus over here tends to operate at a much slower frequency, a much slower rate of transfer of information and checking on things uh, than the I.O. or fast memory bus uh, that uh, connects the CPU and the memory system. This I.O. bridge here then is responsible for upgrading uh, the information that's coming uh, from the uh, USB controllers or going to the graphics adapter to change the rate of flow here of information uh, to this fast bus that connects the CPU. So a couple things uh, then to uh, mention here. Uh, a bus then again is a collection of wires and over the course of history, there have been many approaches to this. I think one of the common ones these days is an SATA uh, drive, although there's mentioned over here uh, a SCSI controller, uh, SCSI, I'm trying to find here. Uh, yeah, there's a SCSI connector here, which is another protocol that was common in a lot of computing devices, uh, such as uh, desktop uh, devices. Uh, the SATA and ESAT uh, and SCSI uh, protocols are not something that we're gonna get into. Uh, they get to more of the hardware engineering part of this, of how do you get communication between entities with one or more wires uh, that are connecting them. Uh, at any rate, there are ways to do that. And they usually make use of a bus that has either a single line uh, which is serial or a parallel set of wires, uh, a parallel bus as it were. The bus speed then, uh, we talked about briefly, is how fast the clocks are ticking on these various wires uh, and how fast the entities on uh, them expect information to be coming, that the ones are changing the zeros and so forth. The CPU uh, operates at a much greater frequency than anything else. Uh, the memory bus is probably next in terms of speed and then the slower I.O. bus that deals with entities that are slower, like disk drives and humans for that matter. Uh, then in between these, there's some sort of an interface or bridge, uh, that's little, this little piece over here, that allows the slower stuff to talk eventually at the faster rate that is needed to communicate with these. Uh, finally then, the motherboard is this printed circuit board uh, that allows for different pieces, like a different RAM chips to be plugged into them, a uh, CPU to be soldered onto it, and usually there are spots then to plug in power uh, and various peripherals uh, like uh, connections to USB mice, uh, keyboards, headphones, etc. Uh, that form factor then dictates what components can actually be connected to it. And so if you're looking to build your own desktop computer at home, it becomes very important that you pick a motherboard that is compatible with all the other parts that you plan to make use of. Uh, compatibility here means uh, it has the right shapes uh, for those things to be plugged into, uh, and the speeds of the various buses that the motherboard supports uh, are uh, in line with the memory chips you plan to plug in, the, the, it's in line with the CPU and the GPU that you plan to plug in. Again. 
I don't know a lot of folks that build desktop PCs anymore except to do gaming. And so if you're planning to do that, then you'll probably spend quite a bit of time investigating these facets and understanding what comp uh, hardware is compatible with what other hardware. One last aspect that we need to discuss is how the operating system manages the CPU and these various devices that operate at very different speeds in an efficient way. One of the things uh, that you'll come to be aware of is that uh, for ease of access, most modern computing systems have what's referred to as memory mapped I.O. This means that when you plug the CPU into the motherboard, uh, the combination of hardware and the operating system will arrange so that as you access a particular memory address, for instance, the CPU accesses uh, memory address 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, uh, 0, 0, 0. Uh, that will actually tr be translated as it goes off chip to seek a particular memory address, not to the memory chip itself, but to some de special device that's on uh, the hardware here. This little controller here, or bridge, is responsible for that translation. Uh, and we'll see at various points uh, parts of the computing system taking memory addresses and deciding to do different things with them than just accessing main memory. Uh, this is a first sort of example to that. Uh, so then there's a notion of memory addresses uh, being mapped to a port uh, associated with some of the devices over here. For instance, that memory address we talked about, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 0, 0, 0, uh, could be mapped instead of to a main memory location, uh, instead to the disk controller. Uh, so as you would be writing memory to that memory address, it's actually going to send an electrical signal to the disk controller to do something. Uh, and as you would send it instructions, uh, you'd probably send information along with it to say, uh, do this, write this uh, to some location on the disk. Or uh, I want to read from that location, which will be interpreted as this disk drive to retrieve something from disk instead. Now this can lead to some trouble because generally the CPU, as it would uh, do business with fast devices, doesn't have to wait very long. Uh, versus doing business with slow devices can create inordinately long uh, delays. Uh, for instance, uh, retrieving something from one of those slow spinning drive disks uh, could take tens of millions of nanoseconds in terms of delay. We looked at that giant uh, order of magnitude difference uh, and related to a trip on foot to Salt Lake City to get something versus a trip to your neighbor's desk to look at something instead. Uh, that's a huge delay. In the past, this would just be tolerated because CPU was fast, but not so fast as to make this inordinate. And so as you would issue an instruction that would, instead of doing business with main memory, go across to these slow disk drivers, the CPU would just sit and wait. Generally, this was all folks had because computers are primitive, uh, the CPU was slow, you could get only one program at a time to run on it, and so there was no real recourse for it. As folks begin to advance, they realized that uh, they could start running more than one program on a CPU if they could figure out ways to share it. Uh, now this created some difficulties because as one program would run and issue this tremendously long instruction uh, that would involve the tailing the disk to do something uh, and then waiting for the disk to get it done, uh, this would prevent any other programs from doing anything on that front. Uh, and so the business of doing uh, operations on slow stuff like this uh, started to become untenable. Um, the notion then became to parallelize this system to allow different parts of the system to make use uh, of various components independently of each other. Uh, there was the notion of a memory management unit introduced. Uh, and that's generally what sits in here and directs traffic around. It can also uh, access uh, various parts independently. Uh, an example is as follows, uh, that the memory management unit could, independent from the CPU, make a request to the disk controller, uh, and the disk controller could eventually send something back, bypass the CPU entirely, and plop something down in main memory instead. This is a, a phenomenon uh, referred to as DMA, or direct memory access. You can start to see the potential of this because if you have this sort of independent chip over here, which doesn't have the full capabilities of the CPU, but can do certain important tasks like access disk information and plop it down in main memory, this alleviates the CPU from having to do various things that would occupy it uh, for that entire time. Uh, as an example, uh, here's how things work in sort of the modern era. 
that the CPU, as it would want something, uh, would issue an instruction over here to the memory management unit to say, hey, get this thing from disk for me. Uh, the CPU realizes this would take a long time, so it, in conjunction with the operating system, would just put whatever program wants that disk file on hold for a minute and start some other program running in here. Uh, the memory management unit would go about the business of talking to the disk controller, it would spend its 10 million some nanoseconds to access some disk file, and when it had it ready, talk to the memory management unit uh, and plop it down in some specific area of main memory over here. In the meantime, during that 10 million some nanoseconds, the CPU can chug along and execute some other program that didn't need a disk file. Uh, so if you had a Microsoft Word that was loading up some disk file, uh, that's cool. Uh, it would do so independently uh, of the CPU entirely, which could then take over and continue to process that YouTube video that you've been dying to watch so that you don't get any interruptions in that. Uh, this is generally then how even a single core with a, on a single CPU can emulate the appearance of multiple things going on at once because it will switch out of Microsoft Word, which looks like it has momentary pause because it does. It's waiting for this memory management unit to do. And this is uh, in part because uh, of the switching between tasks and also because modern CPU systems are just riddled with tiny little independent actors like this. Uh, that the memory management unit along with the disk controller these are independent microcontrollers that are sort of tiny CPUs in their own right that are, have a special purpose uh, to manage some hardware resource on here or facilitate communication between entities. At any rate, eventually that Microsoft uh, Word document will get loaded up, and so you'll want to change back uh, from the YouTube video to get to it. Uh, the CPU also needs some notification that the thing that I was looking to load has actually been loaded. Uh, to that end, uh, the ask from the operating system uh, to uh, tell the disk controller, hey, uh, please do something for me. It'll do business with the memory management unit, plop something down in main memory, and then generate an electrical signal called an interrupt. Uh, this goes to the CPU and will, whatever program is running, interrupt it for a moment and let the operating system take over to determine what just happened. Why was I interrupted? And that electrical signal uh, is usually sort of uh, put into a certain slot in the CPU so that uh, the operating system knows, oh, I was interrupted because the disk controller wanted my attention, uh, and it's reporting that what it was doing, loading that Microsoft Word document into main memory, uh, if that operation is completed, that's cool. I will then put the Microsoft Word program back into the queue of programs that want CPU time and aren't going to block uh, with long-running operations like that uh, on restarting them. So this then allows useful work to go on through the utilization of parallel activities here and also then allows uh, the operating system to be notified with these interrupt signals uh, to, about when certain activities have completed. Uh, this tends to go for disk controllers. It also tends to go for things like uh, user input. So uh, for instance, as I am clicking my mouse here, uh, a click here will generate a hardware interrupt along the USB channel here, which will eventually plop something down in main memory about what happened and notify the CPU that, hey, uh, something has happened. The operating system uh, will eventually pick that up and say, oh, this was a mouse click. I'll direct that for whatever program is in the foreground right now and is dealing with mouse clicks. So I'll click to move ahead now. Uh, generally, this kind of stuff is dealt with in uh, a hardware level implementation of operating systems. Uh, for instance, in a CSI 5103 uh, high level elective or graduate level uh, uh, operating systems course. So we'll talk about that faci uh, facility uh, in a few other instances. Uh, for instance, we'll talk later on in the virtual memory system uh, about the notion of a page fault. Uh, this also generates an interrupt that will cause the operating system to take some special actions. There are a few other things uh, that can generate these electrical signals. Uh, we mentioned I.O. completion, but in truth, uh, the CPU itself can generate an interrupt in the form of a division by zero, given uh, the SIG FPE or floating point exception uh, signal. Uh, and this usually kills programs uh, by default. Uh, finally, in history, it's also been the case that to interact with the operating system uh, in the old 32-bit x86 systems, you actually had to generate an interrupt uh, in order to trigger the operating system to do something on your behalf. 
All this is covered in some more detail in operating systems classes. And in a class like CSI 4061, we'll touch on it just a little bit uh, through discussion of software signals, which are the software equivalent of these hardware uh, signals uh, to some extent. Uh, there are some fine level distinctions between what constitutes uh, an interrupt uh, versus uh, a trap uh, versus uh, a signal, uh, but those are beyond the scope of what we're going to be up to at the moment. Uh, so just be aware then that for efficiency, the memory system deals a lot with these signals uh, to notify the CPU of various activities without needing its explicit and immediate attention. So that concludes our discussion in the memory system, and we've come quite far from discussing early on the use of these two-dimensional matrices and how they lay out in one-dimensional matrix uh, in uh, one-dimensional memory uh, to see that there are distinct differences as you visit memory in different patterns uh, that lead to performance uh, characteristics, uh, some desirable and others less so. Uh, we talked in more detail then about the cache system and why it has this drastic influence on how the speed of your programs. And the first and most uh, influential optimization you can usually make when getting to micro-optimizations is to make sure that your program visits memory in a favorable order, favorable to cache that is. Generally, this means visiting things in as sequential a uh, memory address as possible, uh, so as uh, to utilize uh, as much as possible the chunks of main memory that are brought into cache uh, before moving on to something else that's still in main memory. Uh, we went forwards then to discuss uh, some even more intimate details of this and looked at a simple example of direct map caches and how they work to move chunks around, uh, and then moved on from there uh, to talk about uh, more sophisticated caches like uh, those with associative uh, cells in them. Uh, we finally finished then uh, with this discussion of permanent storage and some of the uh, details that are buried beneath in the hardware uh, and affect uh, better performance uh, so long as you have more than one program uh, that is running. Uh, generally, this kind of stuff is handled in the operating system, so if you're very curious about it, you should start poking around in the Linux or other kernels uh, to see how those things work. Uh, very soon you'll get your next project online uh, and you'll see some examples there where you can optimize or study various memory access patterns uh, for improved uh, or poor performance. And generally you'll be tasked then to optimizing a visitation pattern uh, to get better performance than some default program that's provided and also looking at it, some algorithms to see how the memory access pattern affects their performance. We'll pick up next week with another topic that's related to this, uh, which is called uh, micro-optimizations. I think it's referred to as program optimizations in your textbook, but they generally fall under uh, the category of the last resort optimizations after you've figured a lot of other things out. Uh, we'll start up with when this is appropriate uh, and then conclude uh, with a comparison of uh, doing algorithm optimizations versus memory access pattern optimizations uh, versus code tweaking and generally uh, leave the compiler to do that last bit uh, for the most part. I hope you're all happy and healthy and happy hacking until I see you next.